Tell you about division and what they have to do with group rings and, and negative curvature and sort of low dimensional stuff. Um, and the place where I want to start is it, it's a sort of a very classical question. And the question is if you have two two dimensional spaces, how do you tell whether or not they're homotopy equivalent? So by spaces, for me, that will mean uh, finite, comp finite CCW complexes. You can ask when is X2 homotopy equivalent to Y2? And well, so they better have the same fundamental group. And if they do have the same fundamental group, then there is an old theorem and not our theorem of Kitsa, which you can phrase in the following way. If the fundamental groups of X and Y are the same, then they become homotopy equivalent after you wipe both of them with possibly a large number of two dimensional spheres. So that X2. With, wedge, with some two spheres and y2, and then they become homotopy equivalent. So, this is sort of a topological way to state this the statement that uh, if you take two presentations for the same group, then you can do pizza moves and sort of add trivial relators, et cetera, uh, in order to get from one presentation to another. That's sort of what this is saying topologically. And, and, and somehow, okay, it's this number of spheres, it might be a large number, this might be another large number. You can normalize things by asking, well, okay, let's let's fix the Euler characteristics. So if the Euler characteristics are the same, then if the things become homotopy equivalent after wedging on a bunch of spheres, that number will be the same here and here. And then the basic sort of low dimensional topology question related to this uh, is, do you really need these spheres? And the answer to this depends a lot on the underlying, on the fundamental group. And there are various examples showing sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And I want to start by telling you that there is something there, by telling you about my favorite examples when you do need to do something. And this is sort of, sort of these are examples of exotic two complexes. And this goes back to Don Woody and some other people, but who was the first, who was the first example. And they have to do with the truck mode. Right? So the, the fundamental group of the truck mode not complement, the two generators, relation A squared equals B cubed. So there is an obvious two complex you can construct with that fundamental group. And you take the library two circles and you glue on a disk by the relation A squared B to the minus three. Let me call that complex K. There are others. And, and, um, you have this complex, you can also wedge it with this squares. That's not interesting. But beyond that, there are other interesting ones. And to tell you why that is, let me, I want to tell you why that is. And the basic thing behind it is the fact that this group, even though it's a very simple group, it does have a center. This element A squared, and we've heard a lot about what centers can do to you before. Uh, this element D, a squared, it's A squared and it's B cubed. So it commutes with A and commutes with B. So it commutes with everything. And what that lets you do is, uh, what that implies is that you can write down other generating sets for the same group. Namely, let me rewrite this equation as uh, B is equal to A squared times B to the minus two. And I can also rewrite A if I multiply this by A on the left. It says A cubed is A B cubed. So that lets me write A as A cubed times B to the minus three. Now, now you observe the following. If you put a Z in here and a Z in here, then because Z can use with everything and the exponent here is two and here it's minus two, it cancels out, right? So that means B can also be written as ZA in terms of ZA and ZB, and similarly with A. So what that is doing is it's giving you a new different looking generating set for this group. Okay, so this is 
I can just write it in the following way. It gives you a map projection from F2. That's the first generator to ZA and the second generator to ZB. Here, I mean, you could have taken powers of this element. You could have taken Z to some power I. This gives you a bunch of different generating sets. Let me call them phi I. And this is what lets you construct uh, different exotic two complexes. And so the first person to construct such two complexes with Dungui, he had a sort of clever construction that gives you one thing. Uh, later, people had sort of came up with simpler ways to do it. And the, the, the construction I will tell you is actually due to Harlander and Jensen. And it goes like this. So first you take the figure eight, cross with an interval, and then you glue two copies of this standard complex K to it. So here is one copy at the top and one copy at the bottom. Okay, copy at the bottom. And you glue it via one of these phi i's, the same phi i at the top and the bottom. So for each i, it gives you a two complex. Let me call that two complex k i. So it gives you an infinite family of two complexes. They all have the same Euler characteristic, clearly. Uh, if you look at, if you think about their fundamental groups, well, the fundamental group is an amalgamated product of this with this along this. So it's the trapo group amalgamated along F2. So the trapo group where both factors amalgamated along one of these phi i, you think about this, that is actually one copy of the trapo group. The direction one of the factors gives you an isomorphism. So all of these have the same fundamental group, but the second homotopy group turns out to be different. Well, at the module. So pi two, if you think about what pi two of this complex is, that's H2 of the universal cover. Right, the universal cover of this is the universal cover of this together with the universal cover of this glued along a cover, not the universal, but the trap wall cover of this thing in the middle. And if you write down what the Maya Victoria sequence says, it will tell you that. Okay, so this is, there's H2, there are two copies of H2 of these pieces, the universal covers of those pieces. Then this is H2 of the union. You have the intersection, H1 of this intersection. The intersection is not the universal cover of this figure H cross I, but the trapezoidal cover, so the particular cover of the figure eight. And finally, I'm running out of space, H1 of this piece K, the universal cover of that, and again, two copies of it. Now, these complexes, right, they have trapezoidal fundamental group, and also they're one related complexes. I mean, they're easy to see, they're aspherical. So these, their universal covers are just contractible. So this, this is zero. And this is zero. So the second homotopy group, it's just isomorphic to this. So this is the homology of a particular cover of the figure eight together with the action of the trapezoid group on it. And the action of the trapezoid group is what's important. It turns out. So this is a particular kind of, so this is a VT module. And then it's a computation. It's a non-obvious computation due to uh, Barrett and Dunwoody. So they show that among these different modules, there are infinitely many different isomorphic types. Infinitely many. And so what that tells you is that what that tells you is that infinitely many of these complexes are not homotopy equivalent. So really, you have all of these. They have the same fundamental group, same Euler characteristic. Infinitely many of them are not homotopy equivalent. It turns out after you wedge on a single two sphere, they all become the same. So there is somehow this phenomenon that happens. It seems to happen because, well, it seems maybe it happens because you have a center. And the question is, okay, can this happen? One question is, can this happen in uh, negative curvature? Okay. And that's the next thing that I want to point out. If, if, if that central, why is that even if that I none of them have any? You can put you can put negative. I mean, I can put negative I. No, you can put that one and one negative I. This is a two, this is my answer. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. 
Yeah. By the way, one moral of this story, let me maybe say this, is that what's relevant to this question, very relevant to this question, is the second homotopy group as the module of a pi one. And so this, if you think about what this is saying sort of more algebraically, now that Danny is gonna consider. <laughs> right. If you think about what this is saying when you take pi, uh, yeah, sort of not leaving myself that much space. Pi two of X wedged with some two spheres, each two sphere in the universal cover, it gives me a pi one worth of two spheres. So each two sphere gives me a free Z pi one module. So this is pi two of X plus M, nothing happens, times Z pi one. And this is pi two of Y plus M copies of Z pi one. And if these are homotopy shown, they're isomorphic. So this topological question about whether these two copies are going to say that plus plus M copies of okay, yeah. Um, okay. I can put M here, but let me leave it down here. Or I can put like a plus in the number. Okay. Uh, right. So the topological question about whether these stably homotopy equivalent things are homotopy equivalent closely related to the algebraic question about whether these stably isomorphic modules are actually isomorphic. And there is a situation, a very nice situation, in which the algebraic question sort of has a nice answer. And because of this, the topological question does as well. Is there any examples known that we support that one? Yes. Uh, so, uh, one nice classic example, I don't know, maybe it's not the first one, but one, one nice classic example is due to John Nicholson. So he basically, he has a fundamental group with like a free product of some number of properties, and then he can construct examples where you need more than one. So the state is about stabilization over there, it's just stabilization of this pi, pi 2 and the, the V pi 1 model? Um, this state. This statement was a statement about two couples. Yeah. And I'm saying there is another question, which is the algebraic question. I just said that they're closely related. I'm not saying they're the same. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. <laughs> but I'm not claiming that. Um, okay. So here's the a situation in which you, in which the algebraic question has a nice answer. And that is uh, when we have three fundamental groups. And the free group from you all, yeah. 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 And three finally better. So then there's an algebraic theorem that's due to, well, it's mostly due to cone, I guess it's within a system from back. And it says that stably free DF modules are actually free. Okay. And I, I want to tell you something about this theorem. But before that, I want to say like, what is the topological consequence of this algebraic theorem? And the topological consequence is that uh, if the fundamental group of your two complexes is free, then the two complex is standard. So then X2 is standard. So it's homotopy equivalence uh, to a wedge of S1s and S2. So it's sort of the most obvious complex type of two complex with three fundamental groups that you can look up. And how does the proof of this go? So, in what sense is it a corollary? Well, so the first thing is to observe what does Heath's theorem tell you. And what it tells you is that, well, you have this two complex with three fundamental groups. There's also the obvious two complex with three fundamental groups, which is like a wedge of circles. That doesn't have any pi two. So for that one, you just have a free module. So that tells you that this other complex, your complex from the gutter, I guess, <laughs> is has stably free pi two. So pi two of x plus some number of copies of the free module, that's isomorphic to uh, this thing. So some number of copies of the free module. And then Cohen's theorem tells you that the second homotopy group as a d pi as a d pi one module it is actually free. Tells you that. And once you have that, you can actually build your homotopy equivalence. So therefore, there exists a map. I mean, you can literally build a map from a wedge of circles in a wedge of two spheres to, to your two complex. And the map is just 
Well, send the standard, sorry, send the basis of generators, send the S1s to a basis of generators, and the S2s to the three bases for Python. That will give you a map. There is n minus n copies of S2. And that map will be a pi one isomorphism, pi two isomorphism, and that's therefore homotopy. So that's the topological consequence. Okay. And so the next thing I want to do is I want to say sort of briefly, well, I want to say what goes into this, and then well, say more about this. Then. This is going to be a little bit of algebra. So bear with me. Ready? Right. So in outline, so what does form prove? So the main thing about the need of what he proves is the following. He proves that ideals in the group ring. And, and somehow algebraically, it's easier to do things with coefficients in the field. So ideals in QF and also well, I mean, the must be version FTF are three. That's sort of in some sense to me. And then, okay, well, first there's a there's essentially a formal consequence that submodules. So, so, so an ideal is a submodule of just QF. Submodules of several copies of this, submodules of three modules, so some number of copies of QF. And similarly, a number of copies of this FD are so this is sort of a formal consequence, but for the topological kind of applications, you care about group ring Z coefficients instead of field coefficients. And so you need to put together the FP and the rational stuff into a Z statement. And this is why I said there's an exception. This is for back something. So there is something that I would like to, I like to call back local to global method. And well, it sort of it uses a little bit more and it gives you a little bit less. That's sort of my yeah. idea. But so it uses this, and you also need to know that if you have a matrix with coefficients in this group ring, uh, then you can do row reduction to get it to a diagonal matrix. And that they're sort of going all to prove that they sort of the proofs are basically the same. It also uses that GLN. Over Q F F D F uh, that's equal to just the diagonal uh, elementary matrices. Sort of you can do the linear algebra you want over, over the string. And then well you can put these Q and F D statements together to give you that uh, well direct so to give you a little bit less the direct summons. Right, it's fast. Uh, a free DF module R. The direct sum it means that you have this free module, you write it as P plus Q. That means both P and Q are free. Okay, so that's the outline of the algebra. Now, again, I'm not an algebra, really. And so, so when I when I saw this, it doesn't it didn't jump out at me as something that has sort of Deep topological meaning, but nonetheless, I sort of want to tell you about. I want to focus on this and to tell you about what this means and try to convince you that it actually means something interesting. And if you already know that it means something interesting, then then good for you. Yeah. All right. So 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 what does it mean for ideals to be created in, in, in the group ring? And I'll always I'll use the letter Q to denote the field that. Might as well be a P or a Q, but I, I just don't want to do it a better way. Anyway, so this is about freedom of ideal and freeness. So let's say this word ideal X1 to Xn in Qn. Right, so what does it mean for such a thing to be a free free model? And right. So this is the first thing to, to say is that. Even for ideals generated by one element, this is already somehow an interesting uh, concept. But can I uh, so an ideal generated by one element, that means X, let's say, let's say left ideal, I didn't take before. So the ideal generated by one element X, that means you take X and multiply on the left by two down. 
that that's that's what this ideal is. And saying that this is free, that's the same as saying that this map, the multiplication by x map, multiplication by x on the right, that is invariant. So the reason is simply that the image of this map is exactly this ideal. And if this map is injective, then the image is isomorphic to the domain, which is a free model. Okay. So it's the same thing. I mean, that's, that's just what it means. But saying that this map is injective, that's exactly saying that you can't multiply x by anything non zero to get zero. So x is not a zero divisor. Right. And that's sort of zero divisors in group rings. It's sort of an old and well studied subject. Last week, the key work here last week, we heard Sam talk about this uh, for about five minutes. <laughs> so I want to remind you, and hopefully this will also just take five minutes, but you never know. Um, right. So what about this? So what 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 do we know about zero divisors in, in, in a group ring? Well, so the first thing to know, the, the, the basic example to think about is a finite cyclic group, right? A group, and then their element has some order. Then you have sort of the geometric expansion, one minus p, geometric, yeah, geometric expansion, or p to the n minus one, right? That is one minus p to the n, which is zero in, in, in your group ring, right? And, and if you ever have a group that has some finite order elements, you always can do this trick to get some elements like these guys. Are non zero elements, you multiply them together, you get zero. Very zero divisor. Whenever you have a finite order element, you can always do this. And then there's a conjecture that that's the only thing, well, that if you have zero divisors, you always must have some portion. So you always, if you have zero divisors, you always must have things like this happen. And or press more positively, gamma is more than three. Then the group ring is nice. Well, then Q gamma. I think the history of this conductor is kind of amusing. I'm going to be maybe. Uh, so, this is, so I think it's usually called the Kaplansky, often sometimes called the Kaplansky conductor. I think Kaplansky asked this in 1956. Uh, recently, I found out that Fox, in like, the middle of a paragraph in his differential, pre differential calculus paper, uh, Asked this, 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 this seems like a reasonable thing to convert from a group uh, in 1953. And then Sigmund in his thesis in 1940, well, in his, uh, in his unpublished thesis, he conjectures this. In his published paper, the conjecture is not there, but he proves this for some groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, let me maybe say a, a few words, right? So, so it's, it's sometimes, I mean, we know that it's true sometimes, or it's true for. And Fox, right? Fox was doing his pre differential calculus, he then used his chain rule to show this for three groups. That's why he mentioned it, I guess. The true for gamma three. Maybe we should also mention that he didn't have that time. Uh, he didn't have the archive. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Oh, you were saying why didn't he? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that way it sounds like. I think the unpublished thesis is still hard to find. Anyway, so it's Yeah. And, uh, but it's definitely true that he didn't have the archive. <laughs> uh, Higman, right? So, what did Higman do? Higman proved this for, for locally indicable groups. And right, I, I find the generated subgroup map onto this. Right? So, lots of groups that are locally indicable in local dimensional topology somehow he proved it for a large class of groups. Right? And, 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 yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a conjecture. It's known for some classes of groups. I'll try to write on it here. Okay. Maybe like the biggest thought, it's useful to mention that it became better if you come into a stupid or original thing. I'm not going to mention people at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, right? I mean, if you're going to say it in a field, then it doesn't be on the third. That's true. And so, so if I think I'm very curious to whatever that is, then, well, you know what that is. Um, then this is true. Uh, so I want to tell you something else that's related to negative curvature. So somehow, right, we haven't heard about this yet. Uh, you've heard about this, but why is negative curvature? Um, so there's this really nice result that goes on in the I'll try to write on here. Will people be able to see it here or at all? 
Yes. Okay. Right. So they're really you can't complain the later in the Okay. Uh, so there's a nice result of Delphine from 1997, which sort of, sort of inspired. I mean, I, I think it's great. Um, and it's the following, and it's not hard to prove. It, he was doing stuff in the setting of Delta hyperbolic groups. I mean, just say for hyperbolic space. If you have a group and it acts on hyperbolic space with large displacement, so and large, like there is a specific large. Part that's good enough. So with displacement greater than 40, somehow that's good enough. Uh, then this is true. So this means that, so I mean every non-trivial element moves every point by at least 40. Or 40 is I mean with the standard hyperbolic. 40 is the delta. Then I have to tell you what delta is. I mean, it's not eight delta, it's more than eight delta. Okay. Um, right, but the point is, the point of Delzant's, one way to think of Delzant's theorem is it's saying that if you have an improved version of torsion three, not only like you don't have any fixed points, but you actually move stuff by quite a bit, it's like a quantitative version of torsion three, then, then you have this in order to measure. And let me get, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to draw it. Let me sketch the proof because I think it's very nice and it's sort of, I, I really like this argument. So the, suppose there are zero domains. Suppose A times X is equal to zero. And the idea is now to, to think of group ring elements, like a group ring element, the group ring element is a finite sum, some number of coefficients, some coefficients and group elements gamma in, in, in your group. It's a finite sum like this. And the idea is to think of this as a finite set of points in hyperbolic space. So, in other words, maybe think of it. So let me use capital X to denote the support. So this is the union. So, so you take some base point and you fit it with all the elements where the coefficient is non-zero. Right. So this is a finite set of points. So maybe like this is a base point, and then there is like a gamma times the base point, d times the base. Point. So this is a finite set of points in, in, in hyperbolic in hyperbolic space. And sort of for psychological reasons, it's useful to draw them ball and take the center and draw something like this. It's a finite set of points, but you know, think of it as something that looks more like a hypothesis. Okay. And now how, how is this supposed to be helpful? Well, what does it mean if you have this, this zero divisor? Ax equals zero. It means that if you expand up, so A itself is a group ring element. If you expand this out, it means that as a bunch, a sum of a bunch of translates of X is equal to zero. So the sum, some coefficients, it's depending on eight, eight, three, and B X, these are translates of X, and that that sum is equal to zero. So it means there's some cancellation going on between these translates of X. Um, so this means there's cancellation. That's the important thing. And then you, you draw a picture of what this is saying. That means, so I, I'm supposed to draw some translates of X. So you have one, another, third. So draw these translates. And now so these are sitting in hyperbolic space. And now draw a ball, the smallest ball containing all of them. So the smallest ball containing all of them. And take one of the points on the boundary of this ball. Maybe this is Take this point. So when you say all of them, all of them what? All of them with them. So there are finitely many B such as A3 is non zero. Mm -hmm. Look like all the kinds of BX of that sort. Okay. Those are the finite many things I'm here supposed to draw. So this is maybe this one is called X, this one is called uh, one X, two X. Okay, but there's a particular point here. Yeah. Let me draw it over here so that it's easier. This is X. There's a particular point here on the boundary of this ball. You call it. Now, this point needs to be canceled with something for that sum to be zero. There needs to be something else that also contains this point. So there's a translate. Um, maybe that translate is called Gx that also contains this point. And then you think about what does that give you? Well, this point P, it's on X. So GP is somewhere on Gx. So GP is maybe somewhere over here. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of. Draw a less crowded picture in a moment. 
And similarly, P is on GX. So some translate, so, so, so G inverse P is somewhere right now. So there are these three points. Let, let, me, let me draw this again. It's around the top. Can you draw it on the left? Um, what about here? It's fine, but I don't want to. Ah, okay. There's a point. There's there's about a twelve. There's a point P here. There's B P over here, and B inverse P up here. Put that the same And now, okay. Now this segment from G inverse P to P gets sent to this segment from P to G P. So the midpoint of this segment. It's sent to the midpoint of the segment. And finally, since we're in hyperbolic space, when you start on the boundary of this ball and to go along these segments, less than halfway, these segments are inside of this ball. If you go less than halfway, they don't start spreading out. They sort of fellow travel for at least half their length. So when you get to here, you haven't moved apart very far. And that's there's a uniform constant of how far you have moved apart. That constant is less than 40. That's sort of fellow travel. Hey, Gloria, what, if, what if those two segments happen to magically be along the axis of G, right? Then they don't fellow travel at all. Well, oh. but you wouldn't have this picture. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is why you really have to draw this picture. I mean, you have this. Yeah. So okay, so, so these right, so these points are less than 40 apart, but that means you know if the displacement is greater than 40, that means they must be the same point that you didn't have any translation actually actually you got converted. So that's that's an outline argument. I mean that's it's argument. And it's very nice. And and I want to what do I want to say next? Oh, okay, anyway, that's still not argument. Um so now, so there's an interesting story for zero divisors. And I guess the thing that I want to tell you in the next 20 minutes or so is that there's an even more interesting story when you go from one generator to more than one generator. Is this okay if I erase this? Or it here? Does anybody benefit from the yeah. yeah. oh. so, so what happens when you have two generators? So if you have an ideal generated by two elements, what does it mean for this ideal to be free? And it turns out that there are two possibilities. And let me start with the second one. Because the second one is like this. It, it's that along with it. That there is a map from the two gamma squared to two gamma, which sends to the analog of it. It sends the pair of elements AB to AX plus BY. And the first possibility is that this map is invariant. And in this case, right, in this case, the image, again, is the ideal generated by X and Y. And the domain is a free module. So if this map is injective, then this ideal is that free module. So it's free. That's one possibility. But there is another. And the other possibility is that sort of you made bad choices when you pick these two generators. And in fact, this idea is not generated by two elements, but it's actually generated by one element. I mean, it could be that this, these X and Y, this idea is actually generated by some single element Z, or some Z together. Yeah. That, that's the other possibility. Now, what, so what would this mean? That would mean that X is something times Z and Y is something times Z. So Z would be a divisor, I mean, if you're trying to find this Z, it's exactly, trying to find the greatest common divisor of X and Y. And somehow in know, elementary number theory, you learn that the way you find the greatest common divisor is you take the bigger thing and divide it by the smaller thing, and then you get a remainder, and then you take the smaller thing divided by the remainder, get a smaller remainder, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until at some point you get to a remainder uh, that once you do that, <laughs> that divide the previous thing without any remainder left over, and that's the very common divisor. You can use this out there. Okay. And so, what you want to do is do something like this, except in the group frame. 
And that's what I want to tell you about next. Yeah, there's this old song by Tom Lehrer called New Map. <laughs> you don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but right. So, and somehow in this song, he talks about subtraction. And at the end of the song, um, I think he says that, well, next time we'll, we'll, do, we'll do division, but then there is no next time. So. In that spirit, uh, let me talk about the in, in Q gamma, and I guess the Q gamma part here is new math. Now, before getting to it, no, but there will be something that you can ask that about, I guess. All right. Um, yeah, I should have prepared this better. Huh? Okay, anyway, so so how do you do division in a group ring? So here's the first attempt. So what would division mean, right? It would mean that here's one thing which maybe should mean. So you want two elements in the group ring, and you want to divide one by the other. So one of the one you divide by should better be non-zero. So given given x and y, and there should exist a quotient and the remainder such that well, x equals qy plus r, and either you're do division without remainder, so either r equals zero, or in some appropriate sense, r is smaller than y. Okay, that's that's one thing division might mean. And then, okay, I should tell you what 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 should smaller mean. Here's one reasonable notion that that's useful in this context for smaller. Uh, so you can measure size by talking about, you look at the Cayley graph and you look at the diameter of the support of your element. And then that turns out to be a good notion for this, for diameter of support in Cayley graph. So let, let me just do an example to illustrate. The example is F2. It's generated by two elements, S and E, the Cayley graph. Going. So if I have some elements like, so this is S and this is T. If I have something like S squared plus T plus, I don't know, S inverse, then this is supposed to be, this is S squared, this is T, this is S inverse. Uh, the biggest distance, I mean, the diameter of this, this set of three points is like it's one, two, three, right? So, so the size of this is going to be true. And maybe it's the good, and yeah. And maybe another example, just what's what's the diameter of uh, T inverse, just a single element T inverse. If that's just a single point, its diameter is zero. So, so the good news is there is a good measure of size. Uh, the bad news or better, interesting news is that you can't divide generic elements in the in the free group. So you can't divide generic X and Y in the free group. And okay, these are not generic elements, but for instance. The elements s minus one and t minus one, you can't divide one by the other. And if you think about if you think about why, I mean, I mean this ideal, the ideal generated by s minus one and t minus one. If you could divide anything, then you can just do Euclid's algorithm and find the greatest common divisor. And this ideal would be generated by just one element, and, and that that's not it definitely isn't. So anyway, you see it. It's an abelian isotope. So you definitely can't divide generic elements. That's the bad news. The good news is that we're not looking at generic. We're just looking at a pair of elements x and y where this first thing failed. That means that this q gamma, this map wasn't injective. So there was an equation ax plus by is equal to zero for some a and b. So there was a relation between these elements. And that is what you're supposed to use. Right. So and that's I don't know, from my point of view, that's sort of cone's big, I don't know, one of cone's big observations, right? Is that if you have X and Y and the relation and AX plus EY and relation AX plus EY equals zero, linear relation, linear in the sense, well, a relation like this where AX, B, and Y are all group ring elements, then you can divide in the free group. So that's so, so that's what division algorithm should mean. If for a pair of elements satisfying a relation, there should be Q and R 
such that either you divide without the remainder or the remainder is smaller than the divisor. And then there's it's a theorem, special case of a theorem of cone that QF has division. And again, same with other field coefficients. And Cohen's proof of this is quite algebraic. And I don't necessarily understand it. But there is, in the 90s, there was a paper by this lady whose name was Algan Deloni, who wrote down a sort of a geometric proof of this, of Cohen's division algorithm. And, and that geometric proof is really in terms of sort of the free group acting on a tree and looking at this relation on that tree and using it to you know subtract multiples of y from x to make x smaller sort of the thing that geometric group theorists would do and and, and that proof a first it, it's i think quite a bit simpler and, and second if you see it and you have also seen this the result of delta then it's clear kind of clear that you should be able to put these two things together and get something out of it. And that turns out to be true. Um, so let me see the theorem. So if you have a group and it acts on hyperbolic space with large displacement, and you sort of need more than in Delzant's result, you need displacement at least two two thousand, then uh, the group ring has a different number. And just to give you an idea of what sort of groups this applies to. Okay. So for example, I mean, if you take a surface group, so the fundamental group of a, of a surface, there's some dots here, of genus G, then if G is greater than E to the 1 million, then it's a result of Zeuser that this group acts on hyperbolic space with displacement more than 2,000. And also than the theorem of five. If you use sort of a, a more serious result of Buser and Sarnak, then you can improve to e to the 1000 for an infinite collection of these, possibly not all. So, okay. So, all right. So I have about 10 minutes. So there are several things. Maybe let me. Okay, there are several things I could do. One thing I want to do is I want to tell you about sort of what are the applications, so what are applications of this kind of division algorithm? So it, yes. Do you have a sense of how good that is? Like, can you make it, are there counter examples to having a division algorithm for one group and one group? So for two elements, acting on hyperbolic space, uh, there are examples, but I don't know what the displacement is. I mean, so the, the examples are uh, the examples that I, that I know. I think um, so. This is a non-example. Some of you maybe know what the displacement is in this case, and this is essentially the first thing. So what you do is, right, you take the figure eight not home. That's what I'm trying to identify. Right, it's something like two one one one. Uh, right, this, so this is a hyperbolic manifold, and it's a priori. So, so you can reduce this. So, this is a two real later. Uh, let me see if I'm saying this correctly. Two generators, one relator. Right, two generators, one relator, and it's not, um, and, and it's not, there is a reason why division couldn't have worked for this. Let me say it. Yeah, I have to think through that one thing too. Um, so whatever the, oh, right and then so you do this you do the infilling to cap off the cuts whatever the injective radius of that is is you know you need more than that. so but that's for it you think that they go into this they only have the division yes yes that's what i'm trying to say but yes um okay right. so then this is not a virtual property then it's it's very much not a virtual property it's uh, it's something like you sometimes have it once you like if you unwrap things far enough, then you sometimes have it. So let me say okay, right? So here I was focusing on two generator things. Maybe this is enough. So, like for the three group, I mean, after two generators, you can do three generators and generators as many as you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, for other groups, 
this fails at some point. It, three groups are the only groups for which ideal is generated by any number of elements. Uh, that's essentially it. That's essentially follows from the theorem of solids. There's a special ideal called the augmentation ideal. And if that's free, then uh, then you group a small element one. Um, so let me state a theorem. Okay, so that was sort of groups acting in hyperbolic space and two generators. There is a version of this for things generated by more elements. That version needs more interactivity radius. So, and this is sort of recent work with, with Del Dunn. Okay. Somehow I'm really an amateur when it comes to geometric group theory, and he is a professional. And he knows how to do these things correctly. And the theorem is like this. Let me say this. Way. There exists a function, and I can tell you more about it. Um, such that if the group acts on hyperbolic space with displacement greater than that function on delta hyperbolic, uh, x delta hyperbolic with displacement greater than that function times delta, then um, f of n times delta, then n generated ideal in two gamma r space. And, and let me, okay. People are telling you what that function, what, so right now we have a function that's moving like this is something like 100 and n, right, or to n, so something horrible. There used to be an n factorial to that. But, uh, but it's a little bit of an interesting but okay um in the last uh, four minutes let me so what i want to do is i want to tell you like how is this related to things that people have done before and to do that let me mention some corollaries of this so the first corollary is that it helps you that so in this setting whenever you have this you get that n generated subgroups of of gamma R3. So this is something that various versions of this have been proved by various people in the past. And, and Ian talked about some of this in his, in his mini work actually. So, so Gromov uh, has a version of this and Arzentova and White and um, half of it, Weidman and Bela Lopetsky has some results of this sort that are yeah. anyways. So, so there are versions, different versions of this. Usually, they put more than this. Um, the one, the one of Romo, there's one that has the best estimate, and sort of Ian and I looked at it last week, and we believe it's literate. So. Right, so, so the estimate that Gromov has is for f of n is 10 to the minus 6 n over log n. For this n generated subgroups, that's what's on the chart. And so, okay, let me say what the other thing. So now, this statement is really to get from subgroups, from ideas to subgroups. You apply this theorem to the augmentation ideal of the subgroup. So you have a subgroup generated by elements v1 up to Vn. You take the augmentation ideal to so like this ideal like v1 minus v1 up to Vn. Vn minus one. And this is an n generated thing. If it's free, that tells you the subgroup has to be free. That's, a, that's how this part goes. In. But you can apply this to other things, to other modules, and it gives you other statements. So let me say, one of them is that unrelated subgroups, um, gamma have cohomological dimension less than or equal to two, and let me maybe okay. And one more statement of the sort is that if you look at the classifying space for gamma, so if gamma was a fundamental group of both hyperbolic and manifolds, you look at that manifold. Then this classifying space has at least as greater than n k cells for 
any k between zero and n, strictly between zero and n. So in other words, we take this classifying space, say there's a hyperbolic manifold. Oh, for any between zero and the topological dimension of that. You take the classifying space of this group, you take any self structure on it. Uh, this kind of algebraic statement gives you lower bounds on the total number of uh, k cells. And I think I can stop now. Can you put anything about how we get to? That's NBA versus group. Yeah. Right. So, for the point is, so you take the, so you have your group, you can take your resistance. You take, you take a bunch of data complex for your group, and that gives you a free resolution. And it's like zero cells, one cell, three cells. So, the two cells have to be English related. So, this is like D gamma modulo two cells. I mean, there's, you have to go from D to Looking at a presentation from which for the subgroup or for the. Uh, you replace the group by the subgroup first. That's still actually not the Now, um, you take the presentation complex for the subgroup, you look at the map from two cells. So, so two cells is going to be D gamma, or again, you have to go from D to Q somehow. I, I won't say To the number of relators, the group count. And this is. Some three D gamma module. So this the image of this is a free module generated by at most this many cells. If this number is less than n, less than or equal to n, then the image is a free module. And since the image is a free module, that means you can truncate this resolution at this point. Mm -hmm. And that means you have some logical And the same argument, three is the same argument as three. The higher <laughs> And one is double. Is there any connection with uh, observability in this case? Any, um, no observability with uh, So, observability has a connection to these functions, whether you have like you don't know, have zero divisor. Um, for these, for these n generators, it doesn't have it like for this ideal thing, it doesn't have a connection. It, it's really a negative curve phenomenon, but I should say. I mean, the point is, z squared, the group z squared. Right. The ideal generated by the two, if this is generated by S and Q, the ideal generated by S, this is not free because it has the stupid relation that S minus one and T minus one can be. So it's really, and, and this is definitely orderable. Right. Right. So, so the literal division algorithm kind of statements, that's really a negative regard phenomenon. The statement that I had on the board at some point about if you're stably free, then you're actually free. The, the cones theorem, then the, the stably free, you're actually free. That might be true quite a bit more generally because for abelian groups, that's called the third conjecture, basically. For free, uh, for free groups, it's cones theorem. It's reasonable to conjecture that for writing arc groups or even subgroups of writing arc groups. I don't think there are any, many results in that direction. So that might, their order was like, okay. Whether it's stably free and free. But even if you put the questions from the nine classes, you can use the five and the center. 